It's time for Voice of Indy. Your host today is Bean Weeks, author, producer, and marketing monster for independent multimedia publisher Fresh Ink Group. And good evening. How is everybody doing tonight? As you heard there in the opening, it's just me tonight. My co-host, uh, Mr. Stephen G's, is out on the road right now, uh, down in Florida, I believe. So uh, it's going to be me tonight. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, I'm going to kind of open the phones up, open up Twitter, and we're going to do talk about works in progress. So if you're an author or a musician working on new material, if you have a works in progress, uh, feel free to call in and uh, share what it's about. Um, tell us a little bit something about your writing technique. And uh, I'll share a few of my projects. Um, I've got two or three going right now. But uh, there's uh, all, all kinds of uh, uh, of different things out there that uh, we'll talk about. So, um, so here's the thing. Uh, if you have something you want to share, um, if you have a, uh, a work in progress, like I said, it can even be a musical one because we got a lot of uh, musicians that listen to the program. Uh, you can, leave a comment or a question on Twitter using the hashtag Fresh Ink Group. That's hashtag Fresh Ink Group, not at Fresh Ink Group, <laughs> okay? We have that where people use the, the Twitter handle. We're not going to see that during the show. Hashtag the pound or number symbol and Fresh Ink Group and uh, put that out on Twitter and I will see it. I'll be checking every few minutes or so. And, but uh, I would like to have some of you call in, uh, make this a, a program uh, where it's interactive with the listening audience. Uh, and the phone call, the phone not line is 516-453-9902. Once again, that is 516 516- Four five three nine nine zero two. So works in progress. Um, as I stated, I've got a couple going on right now, but I've got one that's it's it's completed, it's finished, and it hasn't been released yet. Um, and it's part of a uh, a fantastic series of short story collections called Concordant Vibrancy. Con- Concordant Vibrancy, and that's published by All Authors Publishing House. And uh, they've just recently put together Concordant Vibrancy 5, Extancy. Each of them have a different name to them and a theme. This is the fifth one. I've taken part in the last four. I I wasn't uh, part of the first one, but uh, the last four, I have been totally honored to have been invited to uh, participate with this. And uh, I have a a, a short story in there. And... um, Concordant Vibrancies, Extancies. Uh, it's a short story collection based on a theme question. Uh, and, then, and the theme question for this new one is called, is Extancy, or actually it's called Extancy, and Extancy is a derivative of the word extant, meaning to survive or still exist. And uh, as I said, I can, I've contributed to four of the five, and the theme question for this one is what intangible, what intangible elixir is paramount to one's survival? And uh, my short story in there is uh, a, a five minutes in, in, in one night, uh, 38 years ago, changed the paths of a group of friends. They all had their, their lives planned out. They were sports heroes on the local high school sports teams. They had college scholarships and just everything was planned out for them. And one bad thing happened and it completely changed everybody involved. And so that's, but one of them survived. He's the one telling the story. They all survived. Uh, But 
the one who survived and is telling this story, uh, he was put on a different path. And it wasn't anything like he originally thought his life would be. Uh, but in the end, where he's at is where he was meant to be. So this has a release date that the uh, Concordant Vibrancy 5, Extancy, Extancy, uh, has a release date of January 12th. Now, there's going to be a blog tour running from January 3rd through January 11th, with the 12th being the release date. And uh, if you want to follow along that blog tour, um, just keep checking back on my Twitter, my Twitter account, which is at Beam Weeks, and uh, I'll be putting uh, the links to the various stops on there once they come in. But uh, yeah, this is this was a lot of fun. Um, this is uh, Yasmin Korea and Monica Brown, aka Queen of Spades, two amazing authors and uh, just two amazing people. Uh, wonderful human beings, and uh, I, as I as I stated before, I am just I mean humbly honored that they had asked me to be part of these. So uh, keep an eye open for that. Now we're going to run a commercial here. We've got over at Freshing Group, we've got some incredible authors as well, and one of them is Joseph Ajluni. And Joseph Ajluni, he's written a couple of word books, and these are resource books. Uh, for writers. Uh, it'll give you stories and background on where certain words came from or certain turns of phrase, uh, what their actual meanings are, what the actual phrases are as well, because there's a lot of times where we'll repeat a turn of phrase and it gets told the wrong way, but over time, that's kind of the settled uh, version of that phrase. And then you dig into the history and you realize, oh, that's not what it was originally. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and run a commercial here, and I'll see you on the other side. Music has charms to soothe a savage breast. Nothing is certain but death and taxes. God helps those who help themselves. We've all heard these sayings, but have you ever wondered who said that? Hey, we've all looked for another way to say something, so wouldn't a resource for common ways of speaking come in handy? Or you could explore fun ways our language memes reach into the past. You could simply say, you win, but other ways to say it. Grab the brass ring, beat the odds, get the gold, hit the jackpot. Beat the pants off of them and many more. It's all figuratively speaking. Who said that? Figuratively speaking by J. L. Juni, author, playwright, and word maven. Educational but interesting and fun. Explore the many ways we use language and then keep these books for reference. They're available now as jacketed hardcovers, plus soft covers and ebooks, iBook, Kindle, Nook. Google Play, and more. Who said that? And figuratively speaking, are proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. Yeah, so uh, these, like I said, these are resource books. You want to become a better writer? Learn about the, uh, the language, uh, how the mechanics of it work, and the history of it. Uh, we do have a caller, so we're going to take one right now. Uh, hello, caller. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? This is Robert. Hello, Lewis, caller. Right? I'm calling from. Hi, hi, Robert. Hi. How you doing? It's pretty good. So, calling uh, from Centennial, Colorado, outside of Denver. Okay. Um, you got a work in progress you want to talk about? I do have a work in progress, and I thought that some of your listeners might be interested in hearing about it. Oh, yeah. All right. We got a lot of your fan base in our listening audience, so I can guarantee you they're going to be interested in, in what you got to share. So what are we working on? Well, the uh, last book that I published through you guys was Icebreaker, Operation Icebreaker, which is one of the Mac McDowell mission series, the second in the series. And I am completing the third uh, Operation Arctic Sting. The uh, second book... Operation Icebreaker 
tells the story of Mac McDowell and his saturation diving team on a specially outfitted submarine called the USS Toothis. Toothis is a type of uh, a, a type of squid. Anyway, uh, they uh, head up into the Arctic ice pack. Uh, underneath the ice, they lay some special acoustic arrays, one off of Greenland and one off of Point Barrow, Alaska. In the process, they are dogged by a uh, a high-end Soviet submarine that ends up getting in trouble, and the crew abandons it, and uh, surreptitiously they rescue the crew. The submarine is abandoned on the sea bottom. In Operation Arctic Sting, Mac and his crew, uh, using the DSRV, the Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle Mystic, board the abandoned Russian high-end Soviet submarine and find a way to move it underneath the Arctic ice pack all the way to Groton, Connecticut, and uh, electric boat where we build many of our submarines. The story is about this transit through the Arctic ice pack. Fantastic. Yeah, I, you know, having read uh, much of your work, uh, doing your uh, audio books and uh, – putting together uh, the various book trailers and all that, you take great pains to, to, to make sure that your stories are accurate. Uh, and I can tell you listeners, uh, these stories are amazing. Um, there's, you're not going to ever find anything that you're going to say, well, that can't be uh, because the man knows what he's talking about. Why don't you share a little bit about your background and, and how you know this stuff? Well, this is Jill, Robert's wife. And I, I'm here to testify that he spends a very long time doing research, and he makes so much detail, making sure that it's accurate from years ago. I don't think he could do this without the Internet. But, I mean, even the time of the tides back that many years at that location so that he knows that the submarine can make it through that spot. So, I think it would be very difficult for any of the readers to find anything that conflicts with reality. Yeah, that's, uh, and I can attest to that. Um, like I said, having read uh, much of his work, uh, and that's, that's the, the thing about it is the reality. It's a realism. It's almost like you're reading a, a, a somebody's memoir. You asked me for a little bit of my background. Let me take a moment to just kind of summarize it. I Okay. Grew up in Europe, son of missionaries, came to the States, ended up joining the submarine service as an enlisted sonar tech, got selected for a commissioning program, and ended up as, a, uh, as an officer on uh, U.S. nuclear submarines. I left the submarine service to go into the Man in the Sea program, which turned out to be, to my great surprise, um, turned out to be a cover for a, an amazing, surreptitious operation uh, that I ended up leading a team of divers on called Operation Ivy Bells, which is the first, the first of the three books, where we, uh, th- we uh, locked out of, a, uh, out of an old aging nuclear submarine on the bottom of the Sea of Okhotsk and tapped into Soviet underwater communications cables. So I have spent many years in deep sea diving, saturation diving, submarining, and then I got lucky and got assigned to the South Pole and spent a year at the South Pole conducting atmospheric research. And I spent several years up in the Arctic ice pack doing something similar. So I've had a uh, an interesting background that took me from pole to pole and down on the wow. equator. Um, investigating manganese nodules and whether we can mine these things successfully. <laughs> and believe it or not, somebody paid me to do all these things. Wow. So that's, yeah, that's incredible. Uh, the, the things that you've seen in the places you've been, <laughs> that's incredible. It was kind of interesting that a friend of mine um, is, is the man who took the Bathyscaphe Trieste down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench for the very first time in uh, very early 1960. And wow. 
I sent him the manuscript for Operation Ivy Bells uh, to look it over and make any suggestions he cared to make. And he sent me back an email and said, you will never believe where I am right now. And it turned out he was conducting a research project on a research ship up in the Sea of Okosk on the surface above where we had done all that amazing stuff so many years earlier. <laughs> wow. Now, uh, as you just stated, you do a lot of research. Um, is this ongoing as you're writing the story or do you, you know, plot out your story and do the research and then start writing it? Or do you research before, during, and during the, the course of writing it? Actually, before and during, um, especially with this kind of a story where um, the vessel is taking a certain path uh, along with another vessel and they're, they're being harassed by Soviet submarines, um, I, I lay out the general outline, uh, and, and then as the story progresses and as the characters start developing themselves and as, as events begin to happen, then I have a precise time frame and I can jump in and, and find out whether the sun was shining and whether it was above or below the horizon when they put the periscope up or when they broke through the ice, how long the shadows might have been, um, which way the tidal current was flowing because they take some paths where the tidal current reaches as much as 10 or 11 knots, which is uh, 10 or 11 miles per hour plus a little bit, uh, really, really, really fast. It scours the bottom when this happens. And having this information accurate so that, so that I time their arrival at high tide or at low tide or at maximum current uh, makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's, that's meticulous right there. Um, what, what's your writing schedule look like? Do you write every day? Do you have time set aside? Uh. I uh, get up in the morning, take care of what I have to take care of, and then I write. And at some point I quit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, for me, there's some days where I'm just not motivated. And then there's days like I'm, I've been having the last uh, week or so where I just got all this stuff. I've got to get it down and, so I'm not spending hours uh, at the keyboard and just uh, writing it down. But I'm pretty meticulous about that, too. I'm, I've got a, a, a story that I'm working on right now that's set in 1977, and I grew up in that era. I remember the 70s well. Um, but there are, like, certain things in there. Okay, I've pretty much uh, uh, researched a lot of it going into the story, but like you, as I'm writing it, I got to jump over to Google and, you know, the internet and take a look at, okay, well, did they have, were they doing this in 1977 or was that in 1978? So I'm constantly checking on that stuff, but uh, yeah, that's that, that, that need for it to be real. Let me give you an example of something I ran into. I was, uh, you're familiar with the name Kate, the gal that Mac Met uh -huh. near the end of Icebreaker. Yeah. Part of the new story consists of three chapters from her journal while she is taking care of herself while he's out doing this stuff. And in one of the, in one of the um, chapters of one of her journal entries, she's talking about a coffee shop that she and a girlfriend went to. And what I had to do was find out, I had already put them in a condo in Georgetown that existed during that time. And then I had to find a coffee shop that existed then. Whether it exists now or not doesn't matter. But I had to find a coffee shop that existed then, and I had to determine what kind of a menu they had so that what they ate at the coffee shop was consistent with what was really going on then. Yeah, there you go, listeners. That is called being meticulous. This is that that that's the realism of of these incredible Robert G. Willis Croft stories. One of the interesting Perfect. things that. Uh, that uh, Captain Walsh, the, the, the guy who went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, one of the things that he said about my writing is that it's kind of like, um, uh, goodness, um, and Tom Clancy. He said that the big difference is that Willis Cross been there and done that. And he defied <laughs> the readers to find the line between and fiction. There it's that's uh that's good writing and that's good storytelling when when you can't find that line it's 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 there it's you're in it 
All right. Well, By I want to thank you. I expect to have the novel. I expect to have the novel done this month. It'll be in your hands. Uh, I think before Christmas, or certainly before New Year. And with any luck, we can get it out in the uh, February, late February time frame. All right. So, listeners, uh, you want if you haven't read uh, any of the Mac McDowell series or any other Robert G. Williscroft uh, books, get over to Amazon and type in Robert G. Williscroft, and you, I'm telling you, you're going to enjoy these stories. Well, Robert, we have another uh, caller. Also, so, oh, go ahead. You can also go to, to robertwilliscroft.com. That'll take you to all of them. There you go. Or you can even go to freshinkgroup.com and t- under the members page, you can find Robert G. Willis Cross page. And that should take you to his uh, his Amazon page. It should take you to his uh, Robert G. or Robert Willis uh, So, and I believe Twitter as well, possibly. So, yeah, where can they find you on Twitter? At R.G. Willis Croft. At R.G. Willis Croft. Okay, there you go, listeners. Uh, Get over there to Amazon and take a look. Uh, thank you for calling in, Robert, and being part of this. Uh, we do have another caller that I want to get to, so uh, okay. big appreciate. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Say uh, say hi Merry to your Christmas wife, Mary, or goodbye to her. Merry, yeah, Merry okay. Christmas to you as well. All right. Uh, we have coming up here on this line, uh, I recognize that phone number, Mr. Verwayne Ver- Greenhoe. Uh, how you doing, Verwayne? Not too bad, Dean. Thanks to talk to me tonight. Thank you All for right. talking well, to thanks, me tonight. Thanks for calling in and participating. I'm glad uh, we had a couple of callers because, you know, I'm doing this solo tonight and – I'm not really working off a script. I just thought I'm going to come in and talk about some works in progress, and hopefully people would call in. And you and and Mr. Willis Croft uh, saved the day. So I know while you you were talking, Robert, I went out and bought his book. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. There you go. Uh, I know you're a a, a prolific writer. You've always got irons in the fire, so to speak. Uh, So. And I do know, let me go up here to Twitter real quick. I know you left a little thing here. It said, coming soon, who cares for the caregiver when the caregiver hits rock bottom? How to handle your grief and pain when you, when your one and only is dying and you can't bear to put them away. When you can't take one more step, I show you how to keep going. How about you share a little bit more on that? Well, as you know, uh, my wife developed dementia after she had a stroke in January of 2014 and just kept going downhill, kept going downhill. And as I tell people, she was dead. She was dead emotionally uh, a good year and a half before she was dead physically. She died physically. And you, you can only answer the question, who are you? Why are you here? Just so many times without wanting uh-huh. to scream. Yeah, can't, I, I, can, I can't leave her with anybody. I can relate to that. My my grandmother had had Alzheimer's. I I, I remember that, those questions. Who are you? Who are you? Constantly, and it was you know every five minutes. Um, yep. And it was just. I mean, you just want to scream, and um, you can. You can run yourself straight straight into the ground, and thanks to my long career in uh, both as a paramedic and then later on an emergency room nurse, I was able to, I call it fulfilling my oath of taking care of her in sickness and in health. And uh, she uh, she did so much for me, you know, while while she was she was up and moving. That it was my, I felt it was my duty to take care of her, and that that's an overwhelming task. And I don't think a lot of people even begin to understand the depth of responsibility that you step into when you decide that you're going to take care of somebody who has dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. So, yeah, it, um, just absolutely overwhelming, and. You can't go anywhere. You have to lock up her medicines. I had to buy a safe to keep her medicines in because 
she she knew that she hurt, she knew that she was uncomfortable, and she knew the medicine would help. My wife was an OB nurse for 44 years, and a darn good one. So she wanted to uh, constantly get some medicine to make it go away. Well, the pain may have been real, but it was probably imagined, you know, and that's a, that's a real thing. We would always ask, is your pain, decide the doctors would go, you know, is this real pain or is this imagined pain? Because one hurts just as bad as the other. And it got so that, you know, you can, you can barely go on. And if you, you end up with a lot of, I hate to say it, but you end up with a lot of murder suicides when that con- condition continues. If you do not be, have ways to take care of yourself, uh, it, is, it is a very deadly situation. As a paramedic, I saw that over and over and over again. And uh, you yeah, I can imagine where one t- one took care of the other. So uh, that book, I put, I had started that story. And then I got just so far into it, I couldn't do it anymore because I found myself found myself crying far too much, and I had to put it away. Well, then in between that step, I found my second wife. Well, she wasn't my wife then, but eventually became. And I was going through some files here the other day, and I gone, geez, I could finish this up with a week's worth of solid time and that's one of the books I'm working on finishing I hope to have done before Christmas and uh, I've got the cover all done I might as well finish the interior yeah <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah uh, so but I like, go ahead I was going to say I, I always keep multiple works in progress and until I met my new wife I was do I was writing six time slots a day. I would wow. begin at nine, and then I would write for an hour, hour and twenty minutes, and then get up, do something, and come back and pick the start the next story. Whichever one happened to happened to catch my fancy, I would begin to work on that. Well, don't tell my wife, but I've now worked up to four. She made me cut down to two, and I've snuck back up to four times a day. But, uh, again, she's not supposed to know that. But the I constantly, when I finish one story, I work in a noose. I have what a folder I call my uh, pile of bones, bone files, and I go through <laughs> there and I go, okay, let's work with, let's see what I can do with this bone. But um, I uh, keep moving them around as my dad always used to say catch as catch can and just keep going and then i have um let's see lately uh, lately i've been pushing a whole mess of my stories into a, a audible format and uh i've been working with my narrators this morning i approved uh, the final work on used and abused that was my Current wife's backstory. You you read uh, finding myself again. The yeah. details where I found found her. Well, now I'm working on her backstory, and I had to change a bunch of details into that because she's got a very vindictive ex. Who um, so yeah, you know that you had to fudge on some of the details, but some of the things that she told me uh, became very obviously very painful for her but it became very painful to me as well and uh, we would spend a lot of time talking at night going through this to keep both of us from kind of getting too wound up into the deal and um, it, it was very I still want to say traumatic but um, I've been pushing that story I've got um, a woman who just finished up the audio on it this morning, so that will be um, that will be coming out. Uh, ACX, I don't know if any of you were following ACX, but ACX seems to have thrown out the anchor. And uh, I got 
an 85,000 word book turned into audio from eight days from the day I submitted it to the time it was for sale. And now you can't, uh, uh, it's taken. I had one, I had three yeah. this summer that were out there that were in ACX tech for seven months. Well, yeah, we just had one, uh, finally, uh, approved through ACX, uh, after probably six or seven months. And we've got a few more that it's just, that's one thing after another. And, and, uh, we ended up getting, uh, in touch with, uh, you know, calling in and talking to some people. And, um, I believe we have a meeting with somebody coming up here soon that this is just not acceptable. I mean, come on. (laughs) Like he said, throwing out the, and I agree. And I, I wouldn't, in fact, what, what begin to make them move on mine. And you might try that is tell them that you're going to move to find a voice. Find a vo- I think it's findavoice.com, which is commonly known as Chirp. Like ACX okay. is the uh, production model for Amazon or for Audible. Find a Voice works for Chirp. Okay. And, they're, and I told them, I said, I'd, I want to remove my books from Audible. Well, they didn't want that crap because <laughs> they begin to, uh, real quick, all of a sudden my stories begin to move. And you might want to try that. Yeah, I may be hollering at you uh, for a little info on that. Um, <laughs> now, you're, uh, you're, a lot of your books are, are based on the realities of life that you've seen. Um, what's your fiction writing looking like these days? Are you working on anything uh, like a novel or short stories or anything like that? Actually, I am. I'm, I'm going into... This may be a poor time to get into it, but dystopian or political dystopian stuff, and uh, where you take the worst possible, you take your present reality, go into your worst possible thing there. But I, well, that's and, that's and reality. Just, <laughs> that's the reality of so, the world today. Yeah, but I have right now. I'm actually I wrote one in 2012. Uh, that I called the tinfoil hat chronicles and I'm just now getting it stuck into, um, uh, into audible. And he's the, the guy, Brian Moriarty, the, the guy who did one more for me. Uh, he had that, you know, devil may care voice that I wanted for one more, which was a murder story. And, uh, he's doing very good. He's, uh, probably five hours into that story right now and he's really nailing it and I love that just the tone of his voice so uh, so Amazon has put that book up taking that book down put that book up taking that down and at one point in time it had like 70 ratings and now it's got four star rating and uh, wow they keep why, why taking, were they taking it, it they down? keep taking it down what's they the don't, reasoning behind that like the point of view they didn't like my point of view. Oh, okay. Well, and, uh, so they're critics now. I mean, <laughs> well, well, you got Facebook. You know, you got to be careful yeah. what you say on Facebook, or you, you'll be booted I, yeah, it's for just, good. Yeah, I mean, Facebook and and YouTube and even Twitter. I mean, I'm I expect that uh, the way they 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 you know the way they they they're biased against one point of view. I wouldn't expect that from Amazon, though. Oh, yeah. That book was selling quite well. And it uh, the, the really odd part about it was I wrote that as it, as it was developing. I started writing that story September 9th, 2011. Do you remember what happened two days later? Uh-huh. I the sure do. Gazi. The Benghazi thing. And then I found an odd blog, Lame Cherry. Now, allegedly, lamecherry.blogspot, I think it is. Woman is crazier and crazier than sin. But I'd been reading her just because I thought it was funny. And then all of a sudden, she began to talk about things that she knew that had happened that night. And she knew way too much. And, and the the passage of time has proved that she was about 99.9999% correct. And I based my story then on what she was writing, what she, the information she was giving. 
and um, she was far too close, <laughs> far wow. too close to true. And but uh, but I'm writing writing a, a political dystopian thing based on the virus. Um, uh-huh. Okay. That, uh, that talks about where CIA and FBI go completely and totally rogue, and things yeah. things begin to go. You know who who to thunk it? Yeah, <laughs> but, I, uh, <laughs> I I think there's a lot of that going on in the world today. I really do. Um, yes, sir. But uh, but I will. I'm also come up with a new one. I sent you. I included you, as you remember. I sent out my um, my my email, my monthly email, and I included you in that last one. Uh huh. Yeah. And remember, I told you I was looking for question that you for to women that would they would like to ask a man for a male to to respond to. I got yeah. seventy responses off that thing. Wow. And I and it's called tentatively called since you asked. And um it's it's crazy. The the, the excellent questions that I got. And uh, it's just gonna be you know these Women ask me questions, and uh, now I'm going to give them my answers. You know, you may not like what I write, but <laughs> you ask. Yeah. <laughs> Since well, what you are, ask, what are, you're going to catch me. What are some of the uh, – without inflaming anybody, uh, what are some of the uh, questions? You know, uh, give us two or three examples of the questions that they, they came up with. Okay. Actually, I have them here. Uh, okay. They call I, – I got a lot of women going – Women ask me, why do men constantly want to grab my boobs? Uh, I'm dead serious. They're I still mean, doing no. that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Who'd have thought, you'd have thought that would have wore out when we was kids, huh? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it just, it, but, it's the whole, we're living in a whole different era with, you know, the whole Me Too and, and people uh, saying, hey, that's not acceptable behavior anymore. And it's, you would think that, you know, but I guess, you know, there's still going to be some of those rogue guys out there. Well, yes. Well, then they, but I get them. I I got a lot of questions about why, why do men think this? Why? And some of these are, I, I dare say misconceptions, but I've been lucky. I was lucky in the fact that I had a father who taught me better than that crap. Yeah. Same here. And, uh, I had a father and a when grandfather. Was, my f- dad told me when I was 17, embarrassed the ever-loving crap out of me, and I brought him home a girl. I brought home a girl for him to meet, and he, I asked him later what he thought, and he says to me, and again, I cannot even begin to explain how embarrassed I got when he said this. He said to me, he says, you need to remember something. He says, long after the sex is boring, you still got to talk to her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, um, I mean, because she'd been a pretty girl. She was a nice girl, but, um, you know, she had no chance of really cracking the top ten in, in her class. And uh, so, <laughs> but uh, Dad would always... Aesop had his fable. Dad always had his his stories. You know, he would tell me this big long thing, and then he says, "Now I told you all that, so you better understand this." And um, you know, it was when I bought my first car. He took it into town, filled it up, and then he says to me, "Gives me the keys," and he says, it "Doesn't cost any more to keep a car full than it does to keep a car empty." It took me three years to figure that out, but yeah, I, I caught it. But, yeah, but you've I, got a book. You've got a book uh, called "Things My Father Told Me Taught Me," right? Yep. Things Things My Father Taught Me: Lessons in Life. Yeah. And, so I'm uh, guessing there's a lot of that in that book. Well, ex- exactly. And he would teach me. Well, he, I was always scared of thunder and lightning. I was born and raised on a farm. And we had one day we were out in the barn, and we had a monster lightning storm come through, and I was just absolutely quivering. 
and then uh, he he told me he says he always called me Doc because I wanted to be a doctor. And he said, Doc, he says, you need to understand. He says, about the time you begin to think that you're high and you're mighty and you're this and you're that, he says, all it takes is one bolt of lightning to make you understand how infinitely small and insignificant you are in this world. Amen. Amen. So, you know, the thing I, the thing I saw. The thing I find cool Good. about this this book that you've written that, that that chronicles it chronicles your father's wisdom. Your father's not here anymore, but it chronicles his wisdom, and this is something that other people can learn from. I just that's uh, I've read many books like that from you know things that people learn from other people, and uh, they're they're just they're amazing because you're saving this man's wisdom and you're sharing it with other people, and that's I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I wrote a short story. It was called Keep Your Eyes Open. It's a very short story, and it's a true story. My sister died December 19, 2010, had a massive heart attack. I would called her that morning to get some information to help me write things my father. Well, three years later, December 19, 2013, my brother was shot and murdered in South Carolina over a $15 marijuana deal. Oh, he man. He gave the that... guy a 20. He, had, he gave the guy a 20, asked for his change back, and the guy shot him. That's that's and, crazy. Uh, that's insane. Yeah, well. <laughs> but when I was I was on my way home, I, I was living in Florida, and my job was to pick him up in South Carolina and bring him home in my... In my I had a... Uh, a big Chevy Chevy Blazer had the casket in the back, and I was getting tired, and I could keep hearing this voice going, "Open your eyes, open your eyes, Doc. Keep your eyes open, keep your eyes open." Well, pulled off into this little restaurant area, and I walked in there, and my I know it was my dad because only my dad ever called me Doc, and he said, "Doc, open your eyes." I didn't see it. And then all of a sudden, I see this woman sitting there, and she's got two little boys, and they're real fidgety. And I listened to part of her. I had to go to the bathroom, and I come out, and I heard her telling the boys, going, I'm hungry, Mama. I'm hungry. I want to go home. And she says, you can't. You know why. And finally, I said, I said, I don't know what your problem is. I said, but if your boys are hungry, I've got more than enough money and I ended up buying them food and she's going oh you don't need to and I said kids can't kids you know it's it's hard enough for adults to understand what's going on around them let alone five-year-old kid does not understand why he's hungry and you Uh in a restaurant you can't eat well long story short my dad kept telling I know it was my dad he kept telling me doc open your eyes and finally ask him, why can't you go home? And then she tells me that her husband had left her. And it was three days before Christmas, and they had shut their her electricity off. Oh, and she had man. no place to go. So when I travel, I use my credit card for gas and everything. But occasionally, I, I always keep 90 to 100 bucks in cash in my car. So I had a four-year-old grandson at that point in time so I went and got a bunch of his toys that I'd bought from him give them to those kids and then I but while I'm there these truck drivers come out there and they cornered me and they're going what's wrong with the with the lady you're with and I explained it to him and he he says you keep her busy he says I'll do something well by the time they were all done they came there to the table where we were at and they said to to her, he says, your friend here has told us what's going on. He says, I went to all the truckers here in this little stop. He says, I've gathered up a little over 780 bucks. Wow. He says, and I've set you up. He says, and I know a guy who runs a motel just up the way, and he's going to front you a room for five days until you get back on your feet. 
that's a fantastic story there. That lets you know well, lets you know it's that, all true. That, that yeah, that lets you know that they're still good in the world, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it. Sometimes it just seems dark and useless. You know, I I worked as a medic, and I know this. I know what this is, night's about. But as a medic, I saw things. I saw people die that had no reason to die. But then again, I saw people who live who had absolutely, positively no reason medically why they should have been alive after which, what they've been through. And, yeah, which kind of you know, uh, which leads me to a question I was thinking of a little while ago. Um, with your background and you talked about, you know, people that had the murder suicides and just some of the darkness that you've seen. Um, I'm guessing there's probably quite a few humorous stories that you've seen as well. Oh yeah. And would you have, <laughs> would you ever consider, you know, like writing a, a, a book on those kind of stories, the, the, the funny side of, of what actually, you did? Actually, both my first wife and now my, now Lisa is, encouraging me because Lisa was Judy was an OB nurse Lisa was an ER nurse like I was and we got talking about some of the funny things and I'll tell you one that she automatically she I thought she was going to laugh herself to death about we had on an Easter Sunday we had this woman come in who was to say the least constipated (laughs) <laughs> well, it happened to be my turn to do what they call a disimpaction. Oh, that doesn't sound like right any fun. There. Well, we got in there, and I'm getting her, slowly getting her cleaned out, slowly getting her, and just all of a sudden, you talk, you heard about breaking, having a dam breakthrough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that doesn't things, sound uh, like a whole lot of kind fun. Of things, kind of, yeah. Oh, the the rest of the girls laughed at me in the ER, and in in retrospect, it is funny. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of things, um, a lot of things that went on. Uh, I, yeah, we we we've begun to collect stories um, of things that had happened that. That were funny in the emergency room. Well, I had a I had a woman routine ambulance call early in the morning. She needed to be transferred transported to the emergency or to the hospital. And I'm in the back and I'm talking to her, getting the paperwork filled out. And I said, "Why are you going to the hospital?" And she says, "Well, I have to get a barbarian enema." A <laughs> barbarian, barbarian enema. enema? I, I said, you mean a barbarian enema? She, and she looks at me just serious as can be, and she says, you, sir, have obviously never had one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> but, but life is, you know, is, that's always the, that was the one salvation of working in the ER. There was a lot, there was a lot of bad stuff went on. A lot of bad stuff, and uh, but there was also a lot of funny stuff that went on. And I yeah, have, I, I have a, <laughs> I have a lot of those. So. I I, uh, I I from time to time I watch uh, one of the uh, cable shows, uh, you know, true stories from the ER, and uh, there's a lot of interesting stories in there, uh, strange things and. Uh, but but they often they'll throw a humorous story in there. You got the serious one, and then they'll throw a little bit of a humorous one in there, and that's what I kind of like, you know, because yep. it's life. There's going to be moments where it's just dark and dismal, and then there's other moments where you're going to see something funny in that or something humorous, yeah. uh, something to lift the spirit and give you a laugh. I've you you when you're in the business, you live for those days. So, uh, um, it, uh, it's, I wouldn't, there were days there that made you want to, made you want to cry, but there were a lot of days there where you're going, uh, count one for the good guys, something went right. And I'll, I'll promote one other book, The Touch, and I highly recommend the Audible book over, over the paperback, but 
the touch had to do with a situation. My partner and I called it the deal in the ditch. My partner, Steve, and I, we called each other. I was his best man. He was mine. And his wife, future wife, and my future wife lived lived together, and Steve and I lived together, and we told people we just swapped roommates. <laughs> well, there's we a good count in that. And, <laughs> but it was, it was, Steve and I always, always had things under control. And uh, the Michigan State Police called us the dynamic duo. And they would call us when things got out of hand from other people. And he would, um, but they would want us out there because nothing shook us. But we got out there and we found this rickety old Dodge van. I mean, this was like 70, 75, 76 when this happened. And this van was from the 50s. And one of the little boys had stopped breathing. Every time I tell this story, I get the shivers. So um, they got up there and I began to, typically, if you've got a heartbeat and you give two or three real good deep breaths, the breathing center kicks in the way it's supposed to. We got everything cleared off and I started doing it. We're in the ditch of a church in front of a church on a Sunday morning. And there are probably no less than 150 people standing out there watching me work on this little boy. And he's not breathing. He's not making an attempt to breathe. He's making absolutely, positively no attempt to breathe. And I knew something was wrong. Well, you get that kind of thing, people want to push forward. They want to see what you're doing. And I kept telling people, get back, get back get back. Now, this was early spring. It was still pretty nippy. And I had a man walk up behind me. He's wearing sandals and somewhat of a shirt. I mean, like a suit jacket with a pretty plain uh, shirt on underneath it. And he grabbed me by my right shoulder. And I turned around to say to him, tell him, like, go of me, get back. And he, uh, he was mumbling something, and I heard all I heard being strike me dead if this ain't true. <laughs> he said to him, said, Father, let him do this. And then all of a sudden, it was like I'd been you ever touch an electric fence out on a farm? I did. I grew up on a horse farm and I grabbed it many a time, or just brushed into it. Yes, <laughs> so yes, nice job. but it was like that. But wow. I give this kid two more breaths, and all of a sudden he, I don't know if you've heard the term Shane stoking, where they, <laughs> and I finally got him straightened out, and he began to breathe, and we got him loaded, and we headed to the hospital, and he woke up just as we're backing into the bay, and his parents are there, and we get him in there, and I explained everything that had happened. I mean, I didn't explain to the doctor. You know, I thought Jesus grabbed me or anything like that because people think I'm crazy as it is. And, uh, but I was still, my shoulder hurt. I was still pretty upset about what had happened because I couldn't explain it. Anything you can't explain, you worry about. Well, I sit there and I talk to him. I talk to this, his, his parents hunted me down. And they were very poor people. You didn't have to, you didn't have to go. You know what, what kind of credit card you got? You knew these people were dirt poor. The kid was dirty. The parents were dirty, and he is on his knees, kissing my feet, and he's going, "You saved my son. You saved my son. You saved my son." And I told him, "Sir, I had absolutely nothing to do with what happened to your son." Well, we snuck out of the hospital because I wasn't handling that the best. But I went down to the church, and I talked specifically to the minister. I said, who was that? He said, we did, I didn't see it. I said, you were standing right there. I said, you heard me talking to the guy. He said, I heard you talking. He said, but I don't know who you were talking to. I didn't see anything. Long story short, word began to get out that, 
we had performed a miracle. And the local newspaper, whose name I will not mention because they're still a piece of trash, um, <laughs> sent a reporter out, and they they had done a little thing there where, you know, they had portrayed me over the line drawing type thing, me uh, saving this little boy. And that's not what happened, but she came, they sent a reporter to me and it was a gotcha thing. And I knew as soon as I answered one question wrong, I knew what was going to happen. Well, we ended up getting a whole mess of people started coming to our ambulance base because they all, and they were bringing in people who they wanted to be touched and things like this. Thanks. Steve and I finally explained to him, we don't know what you've heard. We don't have that ability, but we will talk to you. Well, for the next seven, eight months, we had a steady inflow of people who would come in and they just, people just needed to talk. How many people out there do you know who probably would benefit greatly from just talking to them? Oh, there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, that's, you know, I've, I've, I've benefited it from, from that for myself personally over the years, just sitting yeah. down and being able to talk about something. Okay, get off the right. chest. Well, these people, well, Steve and I began to, to, to turn these kids, I mean, to these people, this old woman, she couldn't walk very well. And her husband, I mean, he's an old man and he carried her in there and we ended up talking to them. Long story short, you can make a lot of people feel a lot better. If you just say hello to them, if you just shake their hand, talk to them. But yeah, uh, now the, the, the only uh, the thing that wasn't thing, true about that, that I, I just want to interject touch. something here. The, the the sad thing, like what you just said, saying hello to people, the sad thing is, and I see this uh, in our world today, you go to a grocery store and nobody even wants to make contact with you, eye contact. They're all exactly. masked up and in six feet apart, and they're offended if you're too close to them or whatever. And this is what our world has been turned into. This is this is not we, mine. Now, we, we fear each other and and I you know it's to me it's all nonsense but this is what's happening. Well, but we had now I I at the end of this at the end of that story to be truthful everything to that point in that story was true but I did a little flipping around I got shot at a bar fight. I mean, I was oh. there as a medic, not as a, not as a, not as a combatant. <clears throat> and I ended up, oh no, I got better things to waste my money on. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, I was a drunk for six weeks in college, and then I saw the, I saw the stupidity in that, and uh, haven't drank anything since I was eighteen. So, well, but, good for uh, you. We had, we had a, an officer murdered um, who I flipped the circumstances around. I was with him, and he, the only reason this cop was there was because he'd heard that we had been dispatched out to see this one guy who was just ultra mean, ultra violent, ultra just, the guy was just he had a severe psychological problem. And he came out to me, he came out he called me on the radio and he says, Hey, I hear you're going out so and so's place. He says, That's I'm on my way home. He says, That's only a block off my away from my house. He says, Why don't you hold on until I get there? And the guy's nickname was Mac. And we went there and the guy had standing in the doorway of his thing and he says, well, I'll talk to Mac. He says, I'll talk to Mac. He says, But I ain't talking to you guys. Well, I told Mac, don't go, don't go. He, I mean, Mac went up there anyway, took about four steps beyond me, and the guy just reached around the corner, pulled out a shotgun, and killed him. Wow, dang, man, and, that's uh, just, that's, that's crazy. I've, that's, I've seen, 
<laughs> I've seen three murders like that. Uh, uh, three times I was close enough to somebody getting shot where I had to go take a shower to get the debris away from me. And uh, but I I but that I, that is a it's a goodwill story. And like I said, the paperback is good, but I got a guy to narrate that who was exactly what I wanted. I mean, if you're going to get somebody to narrate a story, know the voice that you want. Yeah, I wanted I'm, a young you know, man within. I've, I've listened to a couple that, of your uh, your audio books, and I can tell you, you you seem to find the right voices to match these up, and that's that's uh, quite amazing. Now uh, we're just about out of time, so uh, why don't you tell yes, uh, people where they can uh, find you on Twitter? Well, on Twitter, it's at Verwayne Author. At Verwayne Author. Uh, my, and you can uh, find all of his books and audio books on Amazon. Uh, just go to Amazon and look for Verwayne Greenhoe. And, uh, right. And he's uh, got a lot of really, I, uh, really good works out there. And I, and I just – I enjoy writing. And like I said, this thing – the last two that I wrote about my new wife, uh, people are people are just just going crazy over. And um, well, you 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 read one that I know uh-huh. of. I don't know if you read the yeah. last one, but yeah. I've got a uh, uh, I've got a pile of of to be read books, and you've got a few more in that pile. I'm trying to get break them down, and okay. you know, it's, it's, but you know, currently I'm writing. Uh, I've got a couple of. Uh, I got a, a novel and a novella that uh, I'm working on right now, and so I have to kind of juggle my time, but I will definitely get to those. Uh, I hear but you. I, I want to thank you for calling in and being part of this and, and uh, uh, making this so it wasn't such a train wreck with me just trying to talk to myself out here, <laughs> um, but it's we are uh, out of time, uh, so uh, again, sure. thank you, Wayne, and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas, you and your wife, both. And uh, have a happy new year. Hopefully 2021 is a lot better. Amen. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks for calling in. And uh, listeners, uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in and spending uh, a Wednesday evening with just little old me tonight and uh, my two callers, uh, Robert G. Willis-Croft and Burr Wayne Greeno. And we will be off next week. Uh, because of the holidays, but uh, we'll be sharing an encore uh, presentation of our short story episode from uh, a couple of months ago, and that was kind of a neat one, so uh, keep an, keep a lookout for that, and uh, if you miss any of these shows, go check them out in the archive. Uh, you can go to uh, our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, type in Fresh Ink Group. You can go to uh, freshinggroup.com, beamweeks.com, or stephengs.com. And at all three of those sites, just click on the podcast uh, button, and you'll see all of our previous episodes. You can find us on Twitter at, at Fresh Ink Group and at Voice of Indy. You can find us on Instagram at Fresh Ink Group and at Fig Publishing. That's F-I-G Publishing. And find us on Facebook at Fresh Ink Group LLC. And with that, I, we will catch you live again in about two weeks. Uh, stay safe, everybody, and have a Merry Christmas. You've been a part of Voice of Indy, a production of Fresh Ink Group. Spread the word, support our guests, then find us at freshinkgroup.com. And be sure to hashtag Fresh Ink Group.